it takes people a wee while to tune in. Oh, that's us now, isn't it? Yeah, away you go. 7.29. Is it? Would you all agree on that? Yeah. Live now. I've just gone 17. You're good to go, Dave, if you want. 7.30. Well, it's a warm welcome from Table Tennis Scotland. Um, Commonwealth medalist Craig Howison retired from Table Tennis at a very young age of 28. He is one of only four players to have become the Scottish men's champion in the last 26 years. Also a multinational champion doubles player. It's interesting to know that Craig has actually won um, the national title at every age level apart from one. And that is the Vets. It's not won the Vets title, but it's won the Cadets, the Junior, the, sorry, the Minor, the Cadets, the Junior and the Senior. And he's got another 10 years to go and then he may add the Vets title to that list. He reached the final of the British Championships and at the same tournament, which we'll be talking about shortly, linked up with Gavin Rumgay to take the team gold. OK, I'm also welcome to Craig. Good to see you again. Um, oh, once yeah. again, my co-host is national selector, England junior, international Mark Lumberg. And again, welcome back from a few weeks off, Amelia Norbury. And it's interesting, we've got Amelia, um, an international table tennis player, obviously, but also shared the same coach as Craig in Tom Hook. Um, so um, if you're listening in, Tom, you've got two of your protégés here. Okay, Matt. In fact, to... Dave, can I just, before you go on, three, Tom was one of my first coaches. Oh, right, yes, yeah, and Mark too. So, yeah, Mark's feeling a bit put out there, Tom. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah, there's a heads up for Tom. Uh, since last week, uh, I've only had one, I've only said, I haven't had a birthday, but uh, happy birthday to Johnny Cowan, who had a birthday this week. He was our third or our fourth guest. Any other birthdays, Mark, Craig and Amelia? Any table tennis birthdays you can recall? No. Okay. Brilliant. And if, if I'm repeating myself, I apologise. Uh, Matt will be picking up your responses on YouTube and feeding them through to Amelia or Mark. And as I often say, please try and get them in early because sometimes they come through at 25 past eight and it's um, a little bit uh, too late for us to pick them up. Before we go into Craig's um, early years, um, I'm going to take him back to a very important day in his table tennis career. As I said in the introduction, he's only one of four players to have taken the men's singles title since Ian Stokes in 1994, along with Gavin Rumgay, Ewan Walker and Colin Dalgleish. And uh, let's, uh, where shall we start? Shall we start with the semi-final, Craig, or do you want to go through the earlier rounds? Um, yeah, I can't, I can't remember too much. Semi-final, I think it's probably... Um, Stuart Crawford and you've been the, the sort of number two um, between, you know, between uh, you and Walker retiring and me coming through. By the time I was 17, 18, I'd, I was 18, I was number two and I, I played him in the semi-final and I, I trained with, with Croft loads um, from the age of 12, 13. So um, I used to actually, you know, really enjoy playing Croft and, you know, he, he had some massive shots. He had Wary on both wings and good serves, but I knew his game really well by that time. So I think I won the semi final 3 0. Um, and then Sean had had a, an outstanding result. Beating, Sean had been in Paris uh, training at Laval for the year before the Nationals, um, at least a year, maybe two years by that point. And he'd come back and his, his game had come on leaps and bounds from training full time and, and managed to beat Rumgay in the quarterfinals. Um, and so it was, it was Sean in the final, uh, and it was his first ever final, and he came out the blocks uh, flying, and he went 
he was two 0 nine seven up. And I just I remember I managed to find I was at Lobin at the barriers and I managed to find a a sort of ridiculous backhand winner and the game sort of all changed um from then on. And I, I went out to win the next four sets and one four two. So yeah, I mean I, at the time I probably took it for granted a little bit. I didn't really I, I sort of as you said, I, I, I was used to winning. I won every national title from um, minors up. And I think me and um, Stuart Crawford had started to win the doubles by that time as well. I think won the first doubles title at 18. So I was used to winning in, in finals. And I just expected at some point, even though, and we'll talk about it sure later, even though how good a competitor uh, Rumgi is, in my head, I just expected that at some point I was... I would um, I would win it, and that year the draw went for me with Rumgy getting beaten in the quarters. And uh, looking back on it now, I'm I'm delighted that I took my my chance. Yeah. On that occasion, because of occasions. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, I, I I watched that game, and probably you saw it the same as me. If Sean was going to win it, it was going to win it four 0 wasn't he? You know, because it. But as soon as I mean, I'd seen you and Walker do this with Gavin Rumgay lots of times. Gavin would come out the blocks, take the first two, and Gavin really needed to beat you in quickly. And then you and would just claw his way back. And once, once the tide had turned, um, then and I, I felt the same. I felt once you got that one, I, I, I felt the um, tide had turned. And okay, so we now. I, I listened to you on the Irish show about three or four months ago, uh, and I learned there and it, that you, yourself and you and Walker never actually played an international match together, which I find incredible. However, you were in the same squad for one of the best, another one of the highlights of your career. Can you tell us about that, Craig? Yeah, so I'm. Um just the way things went, Ewan was sort of coming to the end of his career while I was just coming in and he was, at the time when I was just coming in, he was also plagued with injuries and he was, was was starting to play up and um, I got my first senior cap um, although it wasn't a mate, you know, it's not Europeans or worlds but I got my first senior camp at Crystal Palace uh, Six Nation, Home Nations Championship as it was then in 2004 so I was 14 and at that point um, we took five players down. It was a two-player competition in the team, but we also the singles was a big two, and it was a big competition itself on the Sunday. So we had five players in the team, and it was it was uh, Ewan, Gavin, Stuart Crawford, Neil Cameron, and me at number five as a fourteen-year-old. So um, you know, getting in the team at that age, you you pick up things quickly and. And there was a lot of positive influences on me from a very young age. I trained with all of those guys. Okay, Rumgy was away a lot of the time, but I trained with the other three guys, Lodes in Edinburgh, and they were they were brilliant at, um, at helping me get better and improve. You know, it's easy for people to go, especially when they're in the team, the young guys coming up, just to think, you know, I'm not going to practice with him, don't want to, um, you know, lose my spot in the team or show him anything but they, they helped me massively. And being on the team with those guys at 14 at Crystal Palace was was a huge, um, you know, springboard for me to, to, to see top-level table tennis. Interesting. Good. Now, OK, um, two, two big, as I say, that's uh, two big events. Um, it, it's, as I said in the introduction, you also... Uh, won the, the Commonwealth uh, medal and uh, that stays on your desk which is good and uh, for those who didn't see the university years just give us a quick rundown of how you got into table tennis and when it became your main focus I was very lucky in that I had a very supportive um, very supportive parents uh, who always made sure I had the opportunity to, to play a variety of sports and my dad is an avid sportsman himself and so he, he had me playing you know throwing rugby balls and, and uh, playing swinging golf clubs like as soon as I could walk basically so um, 
you know, I was exposed to a whole variety of sports and, and practiced, you know, hundreds of hours before I was, I was, I was sort of six or seven, I would say, across a variety of sports. He actually built a table in my attic in, in my house and, and he played a bit of table tennis when he was younger. Um, he actually played table tennis with Sinclair Houston, who, who I believe is still involved in table tennis Scotland. So he played yeah, with him yeah, when he was... And I also played with Scott Johnson's dad, Barry Johnson, who's now an umpire. So he had a bit of um, knowledge about table tennis and, and rallied with me in the attic for, for some time until I was nine. And then he, he thought, you know, table tennis, I was, he thought he's pretty handy. So let's see if, if there's an opportunity to, to, to get him to a club somewhere that will take him on to the next stage and see if there's something in it. And it just so happened that 500 metres along the road from me was North Merkiston Boys Boys Club or Boys and Girls Club as it is now, which had um, Tom Hook running the table tennis club and had the, you know, it had every single Scottish champion at every single age group at that time from minors, or certainly Scottish squad from minors and through cadets into juniors. And then we'd have quite a lot of senior players coming to train there as well at that time. And so I was always training with Tom was looking back now, um, Tom was, an, was knowing what I know now as a teacher and from a table tennis perspective, Tom was well ahead of his time in terms of the, the effort and time that he put into me. And um, well, well ahead of, you know, things that now that people talk about as revolutionary coaching, Tom was doing for me at age nine. And, I, and on top of that, I was training with the best um, juniors much better than me three or four times a week um, as well as doing um, one-to-one sessions with Tom so within two years I think a year and a half I, 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 I was winning all the tournaments in the minors and then I sort of uh, dominated the, the every age group after that and I think only lost twice between 11 and 18, only lost twice in the, in the age in the age categories. And, um, you know, it was about 12 or 13 that I had to really take it more seriously. I was playing a lot of tennis. Um, and I was playing a lot of badminton until 13. I was in this sort of tennis sort of development squad um, set up, national development squad set up. And at some point I had to, I had to, dedicate more hours to table tennis and at 12 or 13 I stopped playing everything else and just focused fully on table tennis and I had the I had an unbelievable setup around me which again at the time I didn't really appreciate and um, it's only when you take a step back from it later I had an unbelievable people around me in terms of coaches players family and um, opportunity proximity to the training hall that allowed me to, to improve um, very quickly so um, you've obviously done well um, outside of table tennis. So you wasn't sacrificing your schoolwork then, were you? Um, no. I, I able to combine it, studies and table tennis? Yeah, I managed to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, again, I had a, my, the, the expectation from my family was that they were both, my mum and dad were the first to go to university from from their families and the expectation was that I would go to university. Um, and, and so there was pressure on me to do well at school. And I think I could have done better at school. I could have applied myself more and I probably sacrificed myself my schoolwork a little, my grades a little bit, but I still did what needed to be done in order to, uh, and, and when it came, in order to, you know, get good exam grades and, and get the grades to go to Edinburgh University, which obviously, um, even though it's just PE, as some people will say uh, that the great the entry requirements are pretty tough, and so so yeah, I uh, I I managed to do both, and um, and I'm quite thankful for that. Now, okay, so obviously as you're moving up the ranks in table tennis, uh, you're thinking about leaving school. I know we we covered this a little bit on the university years. And I think you said at the time, 
um, all of you were asked the same question and you all gave different answers. Uh, your answer then, if I'm right, you basically chose the university and the course to enhance your table tennis. Is, is that fair or, or well, was that oversimplifying it? Well, I think because of my upbringing, I was really interested in, in sport and in all sports and I had a... Um, and I, I had a good way with people generally, and I liked a variety of sports. I liked teaching, and I liked coaching, and things like that as well. And so, PE teaching was a sort of obvious and um, comfortable route for me to go down. Yeah. And I, I don't regret it in the slightest. And, and, and it allowed me, to, as you say, it allowed me to train in hard as well. I, before I went to uni, I went down to Bristol and I spent a lot of time in Bristol and Sheffield with the, and Sheffield yeah. with the British squad. And my and my preference at that time was to try and stay in Sheffield. I wanted to stay in Sheffield and I wanted to stay full time. Yeah. Um, but for whatever, you know, it just didn't, it just didn't work out. Uh, and, and so we come back and make the most of what we had in Scotland at the time. And again, the way things worked out, we got a lot of funding for the run up to Delhi Commonwealth Games and then Glasgow Commonwealth Games, and we had Lee Chow here for two years. And um, I was sort of in Scotland, I was the main man, I was the highest ranked player, I was the youngest, I was the one who Sports Scotland had identified could back Gavin up in the Commonwealth Games, and so I was just right place at the right time and, and took full advantage of that opportunity in my career to again improve as much as I could. Do, did you find um, this is, you know, to help the ones Amelia's age and, and the others? Um, did you find playing table tennis easier when you were at school or easier in terms of opportunity and tiredness or when you were at university or roughly both the same? Did it just, was it a natural progression? I think I, I um, yeah, we talked about this in, on the, the university years and for me, I saw myself as a table tennis player at university, right? Yeah. So I didn't prioritise my university work over table tennis. Now, you can, I can't sit here and recommend to, to people like Amelia that that's the right decision. It was the right decision for me because I knew I could pass my course and get my degree um, while still prioritising table tennis. So for me at uni, it was miles easier to train hard while I was at uni and train more compared to when I was at school. You know, school is very rigid. You're in school eight till half three every day. Very little flexibility to get off from that time. University is a bit more flexible. Lectures are online, especially at the moment. Lectures are online. Um, the, the university day is a lot more split up. You spend less time in seminars and classrooms. And so I was always very organised. Um, and my, I could organise my practice and a lot of practice around my university day much easier than I could do when I was at school. Up, up until that time, uh, Craig, did, did you remain injury free right from junior to through your university years? Never never had um, any sort of injury until I was well into my 20s. Um, yeah. and, and that was part of the problem, to be honest. I, you have this feeling, and you know, it's really, I don't want to come out with cliches, but when people who are 30 are telling you when, you know, I remember Stuart Crawford used to say he was sore after training and things like that. And I would be like, like come on, Dave, because I never felt so. I never felt so. And they, they would tell you, you've got to look after your body. And I thought, well, I, I don't because I've never, I never have injuries. I never, but the amount of strain and pressure you're putting your body under when you're doing these things, just because you don't feel it when you're 18, 19, doesn't mean it's yeah, not going to come back and bite you on the backside later. And, and unfortunately, um, as we'll, we'll probably come on to this later, for me, um, it, it came back really badly and I didn't prioritise the right things to make sure, make sure or I didn't have the, the um, foresight to make sure that I would be able to stay injury-free for the 
Was your diet was your was your keen on your diet? Um, I'm curious. I've not asked many of the players that. Uh, um, I, mean, no. I used to say to the table tennis players, if it goes off quickly, it's good for you. Vegetables, fish. If it yeah. lasts forever in a tin, it's bad for you. Was your diet good? Um, not particularly. Uh, I've got to say, since I finished playing table tennis, there's been I've made significant changes in my life for the better of my health. Uh, there's no doubt about that. My, but I think that part of the problem was actually table tennis. You know, I was my typical day when I was at university is I would study. I would study at university. I would go to the gym. And do, I had a really good strength and conditioning set up. I think the uni had good coaches, which, and so I would go to the gym, study, and then eight o'clock every day I would drive through to Glasgow. And I would train from half five till nine. Now, that those timings are not conducive to being able to to plan out and have organised healthy meals. And so when I got home at half ten every night from training, ten half ten, it's much easier to stick something in the oven and not have to worry about it than spending twenty minutes making yourself a, a good recovery meal to recover from training effectively, etc. Et 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 and so, you know, you prioritise the things which you think are going to have the biggest impact on your table tennis at that time. Yeah, yeah. So I prioritised getting to training early and training as hard as I could. And actually, I didn't prioritise some of the things which were going to be allow me to sustain my career for longer later. Okay. Right, one of the questions, this is a little bit unfair because I've, I've not covered this with you. Um, um, what would a 30-year-old Craig Howison be telling a 12-year-old Craig, Craig Howison? And then what would he be telling a 14-year-old Craig Howison at 16? Right. So at 12 years old, I wouldn't have told myself anything. I would have just said, just keep doing what you're doing listen to Tom Hook, take every opportunity you can with, I wouldn't have done anything differently at that age. I think um, the rate at which I was improving at 12 years old was exceptional. You know, I, I beat Craig Gascoigne, who was number five in Scotland when I was 12. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to complicate that too much. I don't think at 12 years old. So I don't think I would have said anything different, just enjoy it. Yeah. Even at 14, so I don't think I would, I would be complicating it too much. But then once I started getting into the senior team, once I started beating the other senior players like Stuart Crawford and, and, and Neil, I think I would have been saying to myself, look, being number two in Scotland is, and I would have said this to myself throughout the rest of my career, being number two in Scotland you're a, you're a, and no disrespect to Scotland or anything, but you're a big fish in a small pond. And actually, in order to kick on and, and get the results that I really wanted to achieve with the team and for myself, I should have been looking way much further afield than, 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 than being number two in Scotland. I think the other thing I would say to myself at 18, 19, um, would be do yoga, stretch. That's what I that's, that's was waiting for. Um, that's what I was waiting for. Prioritise more of your time on injury prevention, on things which are going to allow you to, to play for longer. Um, and you don't, you don't reap the benefits of those things. And it's really difficult to, to see or realise the benefits of those things in the moment. You don't get the benefits of those things in a week or in a year even. You get the benefits of those things in seven, eight, nine, ten years. Um, and I, I, that's definitely something that um, that I would have I would have changed. And then and then later on in my career, when I went through my really sort of um, horrible phase in table tennis, as I think about it, between sort of 2011 and 2013. 
really years, ironically, after, just after I won the national championship, I would have said to myself, like, you just have some perspective, have some perspective on the game and, and find a way to find a way to train more purposefully than I was. Yeah. And that's a good question. Good, good. I wish I knew I wish I knew then what I know now. It's appreciated. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. Like uh, we started the show and I said it was Johnny Cowan's uh, birthday this week. So I wish him a second happy birthday. But when he looked back on his career, and I think I might have touched on it last week, he was all wham bang, buckets of sweat, and the thought of stretching and uh, extending the muscles and to help to reduce the risk of injury and muscle that it's extended and contracted on a number of occasions will do so more forcefully than one working from cold. It, 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 again, it was only in his later years that he realised, you know, that, that, that side of it. And because it's like money in the bank, as you've said, Craig, you're really putting money in the bank and you don't draw it out until you're 28. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, who's going to go first, Mark or Amelia? Mark, do you want to go? Do you want to? Yeah. So, so okay, just we obviously covered up some really good points also in our first sort of half an hour there. Um, so touching on three things that I've written down. Uh, so the first one being, and you, I think back, I actually wrote this question when you were talking about Tom Hook and his being ahead of his time and being coached by Tom. And I couldn't agree more. I think Tom gave you an understanding of how to win a match at an early age. So I just wanted, first of all, to touch on that, of the importance of learning tactically how to win a match. And did you grasp that earlier? Did you find that you needed a corner man or someone after the game to explain to you what had happened? Or do you feel tactically that you, you were ahead of the time at a young age? Yeah, uh, I definitely was um, um, better than a lot of the other guys my age and even above me. Um, Tactically, and you know, Tom, Tom has got files, files that are like that thick. Yeah. Me from the age of, and Amelia's seen them, I'm sure, right? Of of me from the age of nine to sixteen, of all these matches analysed, all my results, um, all sorts of different quotes from table tennis books, and like honestly, the amount of knowledge that he's got. Um, and the amount of information that he gathered on me in those seven years is, is frightening. And he was able to use that and help me and cultivate me into to learning things more than other players my age were able to do. I mean, at that age, from a young age, I, I, I was a real student of the game. I loved it. I would go home and watch table tennis after school. I had, I had all the DVDs of the Bercy World Championship 2003. And I would go home and watch them one after other, same matches over and over again. So that also gave, you know, that, that's like extra study time. Yeah. Right? It's extra time where you're picking up on things, even though you're not conscious of it at the time, you're picking up on things and you're figuring things out. So, but I think the biggest thing that Tom gave me was, was, was a mindset. Right? And Tom, would, from a very early age, he wasn't bothered, wasn't actually concerned with me winning matches at 10-11, even though I was. He was much more bothered with me playing the right shots, trying to play the correct shot. You know, loads of players would push backhand to backhand and win matches like that at 9 or 10. I never did that because Tom said, play, play the right shots and, and you'll get the fruits of your labour later. And once I started doing that, my, the mindset is not fixed. The mindset is not short term. It's about how you're going to be a, a better player longer term. And Tom um, was, and is, I'm sure, still a, a brilliant coach for that reason. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, Tom took me on at young age, Gavin and that as well. Um, and I think, it, I mean, I remember just very quickly, Scottish primary final, uh, being with Tom beforehand for the tournament and the week leading up to it. And there was an hour with those pages of books that you're talking about, about the opponents that I was going to play and how I was going to play them. Um, yeah. And it worked, and he was correct because I won the championship and I actually played to those tactics. So yeah, absolutely spot on. Just, second yeah. point, just leading on to Craig, just uh, um, 
listen to university years, and obviously I listened to the what Dave referenced earlier, the ones with um, Ryan Jenkins, the podcast you've done. It sounds like sounds that your table tennis development was exhausting. Okay, like obviously the stuff at university, traveling through to Glasgow. How I mean, just on reflection now in retirement, thinking back on your, your career, do you think it was too much? Do you think looking back of traveling back and forward to Glasgow, sort of three four times a week, the training? trying to do university, trying to do it, would you change anything or do you think it was right for you? Uh, at, at that time, I absolutely wouldn't have changed anything. Um, looking back on it now, I think, you think, I don't know how I did it. Right? I don't know how I did it. I mean, the training at that time as well was, it, it was you know, it was really, really intense training. So we Chow, multi-ball, we had two Chinese practice partners, one of whom was like top 100 in the world standard. And I'd be on with him for at least an hour and a half of the night, plus an hour, of, plus an hour of multi ball, plus an hour of match practice. Right, so like the intensity of the training, and that was five nights a week, every week, or you know, plus weekends. Um, the the I wouldn't have changed driving through and all that. I don't think it was too much. What I think was that I, again, I would have spent more of my time. I would have finished training twenty minutes early and looked after my body a little bit more, stretched, take my time to cool down properly. I would literally, I would rather do an extra, at that time, I would have done an extra 20 minutes knocking my pan in on multiple and then get straight in the car and drive home. Now, accumulatively, now knowing what I know now, accumulatively, having that 20 minutes to, to recover and, and, and you know prehab, would have been a much better use of time. Um, I think that the thing which was really um, hard for me, which which probably was too much, was again sort of that time between 2012 into 2013 when I started teaching. And I would, I, you know, teaching is pretty hard and tiring and stressful anyway, never mind when it's your first, first year doing it. And I would teach all day. I'd, I was in the gym three mornings a week at 6 a.m., before school, then I would teach all day, and then five days a week, I would then train, go straight from school and go and train for three hours. And I remember being in the hall early, and I would sleep for an hour, being in the hall early before training started. I was so knackered and exhausted. And actually, you can't train productively in that headspace, you know? You're better to take a night off, a day off, two days off, train three times a week, and make your training really purposeful than doing what I was doing, but I couldn't see that. My whole thing, it sounds a wee bit like Johnny Cohen, my whole thing was I'm trying to compete against guys, the English guys, I'm trying to compete against the guys who were playing full-time, Irish guys who had moved to France. I've got to be on the table training as many hours as possible to, to try and be able to, to compete with them as close as I can and not let them get ahead of me. Yeah, no, uh, fascinating, because I was asking that question, because obviously knowing what you know about sport now and then looking back and the physiology of, of how to be a top athlete, was it, it obviously sounds like that obviously the, the work that you put in and that work ethic was just unbelievable, but it's just, but it also sounds tiresome on the mind um, that you don't realise at the time you're young. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you just want to play table tennis, but actually going back as a coach now, uh, obviously if you're going to go into that and obviously reflect on a player on that similar um, ability was that you have that opportunity now maybe to step in and actually change that a little bit it would just be my, my thoughts and reflection to what you said uh, just a last point just for a hand to Amelia for any questions was did you have I mean, questions that have come up throughout we've done these sessions about playing abroad and the opportunity about playing abroad um, Sam Wilson that we've had on the last couple of weeks uh, is obviously in Sweden um, you mentioned Sean Doherty earlier the, the going to abroad did you ever have that opportunity um, and did you ever consider it, even if without that opportunity, did you did you think about it, going abroad to try and enhance your tail with Anas? Um, obviously, it's an option for every tail, you know, any international tail with tennis player at 17 or 18, you've got a big decision to make. Right? It's a big crossroads there, which maybe you don't appreciate the time again. Um, I sort of compromised by going to Bristol. 
and they had Sheffield at the time, and I was sort of involved in this sort of British Table Tennis Federation sort of long sword. So you had the top, top guys, the young ones in the run up to London 2012, who were on the top funding. And then you had a group underneath that, um, which I was part of. So I got invited to go to Sheffield basically whenever I wanted. And in Sheffield, you had three, full, three or four full time coaches, the best players in Britain, sparring partners from the best countries in Europe plus China. Oh, um, and I had um, Kevin Satchel, the ex-Scotland coach, was at, at Bristol and was, Rungi was down there and Darius Knight was there sometimes as well and Jenks was kicking about there. So I sort of thought, I'm better to go to stay in Britain where I know people are going to invest time in me and really I'll be the main man and be the focus of, of certainly in Bristol, focus of a lot of the training I'm going to get the best training partners than going to stay Sweden or France, Germany, and maybe not being the best player, not being the top man, and maybe the coaches sort of not, not getting the attention that I felt I needed and I wanted to really kick on. There's a lot of guys go abroad and get better from just fewer training hours compared to what they've done previously. Um, I, I don't, yeah, I, I, of course, it was an option. But I made the decision to compromise, stay in Britain, and then and then went to uni. So it's a difficult one going abroad. I think I think you've got to be the right personality. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I I, I would have um, enjoyed it that much. Thanks, Craig. Amelia. Well, I just I have kind of a question that carries on from that. Was be like, what is your advice to kids who play table tennis at that kind of age? 17, 18, when you're con like considering going to uni or going abroad as a player? It comes back to another thing we talked about on the university years. It comes back to how high up on your list of priorities is table tennis. How high are your ambitions in table tennis? If you want to be, and I don't say this lightly, but if you want to be a, just, just a national team player, and I don't say that lightly because I know a national team player is a good thing and it's a big achievement. But if you just want to be a national team player, you can probably make certain, go to certain places where you know you might be able to get a bit of practice and make, sort of maintain your level and stay in the national team because we've not got enough, um, we've not got enough strength and depth in, the, in, in Scotland, but you might be able to keep your place, right? If you want to move on to the next level and be number one or two in Scotland, I want to move up the world rankings and want to compete at a really high level where you're competing for medals at international competitions, etc. Then whatever university you go to, whatever city you decide to go to, table tennis has to be equal with, in terms of priorities, whatever you choose to go to university. Yeah. You need to go to a university where you know you're going to be able to access high quality and um, purposeful practice and a good quantity of it. So it's, I can't answer that question for people. People have to think about what do I want out of the game and make their decision based on a list of priorities. Yeah. Cool. Um, the other question would be one from Pete Lupton, which said, any plans for going forward as far as coaching? Um, short answer. Short answer, no. Um, I'm, I'm locked down, definitely brought my, my passion back to the game. Um, but, and so, so I'm, I'm, I'm eager to pick a bat, a bat up again whenever we can. I'm, Texting Colin Dalgleish all the time, trying to get him to practice. Uh, but it's difficult with his new job and things. But, you know, I'm eager to get back back in my hand. I'm eager to, to, to play again. And, and that might end up in me coaching again or coaching. Um, but we'll see what the, the future holds. We'll see what happens after COVID. Uh, I definitely want to be involved in table tennis. I definitely, more specifically, want to help table tennis Scotland, give players in, in Scotland some of the opportunities that I think I 
I would have appreciated that uh, very much. Yeah, awesome. Cool. A quick fire in Amelia. Okay, yeah, I can do quick fire now. So, um, were you spin based or power based or 50 50? Um, power, probably. For timing, generally, were you early, top of the bounce, or after? Um, gen when I was playing my best, I was I was early, definitely. Um, what's your most effective or strongest stroke? My forehand counter spin. Your least effective or weakest stroke? Probably my blocking, my defensive play close to the table. From any player, what is the one stroke you wish you had? Ooh. Um, I think I think probably a really aggressive forehand flick, um, or or you know, good serves, great you know top level serves. Yeah. Watched Rungi and um, do unbelievable things in the international scene with his serves. So. Um, what's your best or favourite serve? Um, my best serve was probably just a low toss side side and top spin short to the forehand. Probably my favourite. Um, your favourite ever opponent type, so like defender, spinny blocker, power. Um, I was always good against choppers, always good against defenders, and loved playing um, blockers. Loved playing. I love being the one attacking all the time and, and, and the other person being passive. And um, your least favourite type of opponent? Um, anyone who could get in with the first top spin before me. Um, the best player you've ever played against? Um, so uh, probably Gao Ning. So I lost to Gao Ning in, in the Gold Coast and Commonwealth Games and he went on to win the gold medal in the single. I think he was top 10 in the world at one stage. So. Um, the victory that gave you the most pleasure? Um, that's that's, I know it's meant to be quick fire, but that's, that's, that's tricky. The victory that gave me the most pleasure. I think we'll just, we'll go with uh, the Nationals final, the men's singles final. And finally, the player you most admire. Um, I think I think the things that Pittsburgh has done and uh, and and is really commendable. Going abroad at such a young age and getting to the standard that he's gotten to through sheer hard work, determination, and self belief is 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 spectacular. So yeah, I'd have to go with Pitch. Okay, have you got a question, another question of your own, Amelia? Or are you quite happy for the time being? Yeah, I'm quite happy. I can't think of anything. Okay. Um, during the large part of your career, Craig, um, Gavin Rumgay was the number one player. Um, did you find having Gavin... Um, did that make you a better player? Did that restrict you, or what? What was your feeling um, being in the same era as uh, Rumgay? Um, I think very, very good. I think <laughs> whenever I was in the team, I was going on, and you knew that whoever we played against, you knew in the team event, you knew that Rumgay had a chance of, of winning those two matches, which meant that I just had to pick up one. Um, and quite often, quite the amount of matches that I won for the team were the one three two with Gavin winning his two and me winning the fifth match at two all, um, and big big matches was was massive. So from a team perspective, in terms of um, doing well in World European Commonwealth Championships, it was brilliant having Rungi as a number one, and it was brilliant from a from a development point of view for me. Of always having somebody above me to, to, to push you on. What I think 
wasn't good for me as I was too too comfortable at number two. Um, and I think um, while I'm not even too comfortable at number two, I was too comfortable in the team. Yeah, yeah. We needed what in order to really push the number two, three, four on is we need a really competitive strong group from five to fifteen. And and England have really suffered with this as well. There's not enough strength and depth just because there's not enough players playing. And while it was great that Rumgy was number one, I wasn't reaping that many benefits from that because Rumgy was away training full time abroad or down in Sheffield. And so I wasn't getting to practice with somebody better than me all the time when when practice dried up in Scotland to actually reap the, the direct benefits from him um, all the time. And so that gap was only ever getting going to get bigger. The one game was always getting much better practice than me and a much better setup than me. And I had obviously tools and education and I wasn't getting the same level of practice. So I was never really able to bridge that gap between us. And even if I had been getting the same practice, it's arguable whether we, whether I would have been able to bridge that gap. So from a development point of view over a long period of time, it probably didn't help me that much. And and one thing which really stopped me from whenever I got beaten by somebody below me, my intensity and my determination and practice subconsciously went up. So Sean beat me in 2012 or something like that. And he didn't get near me again really until 2017. He beat me again. So five years, my nearest rival because I stepped up. My training and, and we needed more of that. We needed more people like Sean to beat me. We needed yeah, yeah. four or five people to beat me for me to really um you need somebody pushing me all the time. And, and I was just a wee bit too comfy, probably. Um so while having Rongi in the team was brilliant, I didn't reap enough of the benefits from from being able to practice day in, day out with that level of player. Yeah, yeah. And um um did you do you think Gavin was at his best during your era, or do you think he was at his best during you and Walker's era? What what would would you say? What, what or what year would you think Gavin was 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 at his best? Because you would have been playing with him just about. I mean, it, it could be now. Well, I think I think I think definitely during my era. I think I think yeah. Gavin was still getting better and still improving. In, in 2010, we had an unbelievable tournament in Moscow, the World Championship. Um, I was only 20, but I'd improved loads in that two years. Rongi had been in training in Sheffield for the last two years with the British team. Yeah. And, and we both, and, and um, Neil Cameron as well, we, and, and Crawford, we, we all had an amazing tournament. We came one place behind England. Yeah, yeah. 2010. And, and Rumge beat, I think, three or four guys in the top 100 in the world in one tournament. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not saying that's when he was at his best because I think Rumge has added things to his game, added layers to his game as he's gotten older, yeah. which have made him a, a, a better all-round player. But certainly at that, at that point, he, he was very, very strong and he was given the... And, and that was also with the old ball, right? The old, not the 38 mil, but, you know, the celluloid ball, which is a bit spinnier and a bit grubbier for his game. So, the, you know, the top guys, the top guys in backhand to backhand, forehand to forehand, being totally honest, and I'm sure Rumgey would say this himself, he wouldn't have had a chance, right? But Rumgey was so good mentally and tactically yeah. um, and serving and receive, especially with the old ball, but it was spinnier, he would, he would just, you know, it was just too clever, even for guys in the top 100 in the world. And you know, there were things in this game that, and it still is, I'm sure, but I think it's nullified a little bit now, but there's still things in this game that he, um, at that point, which these guys hadn't seen before, which were totally unique. Yeah. And so I know he got to his highest ranking much later than that. Um, 
but I think with the old ball, it was particularly uh, difficult. Yeah. I, I, I think the rankings. Um, it, I think the rank. I think all rankings are pretty accurate, one to thirty or whatever. But um, um, it, and this goes for a number of sports. Once you get past a certain number, it's just a case of if you play badminton, just go to as many tournaments as possible and, and pick up the points. Well, um, but that's credit to Rumgi's knowledge of the system. Yeah. The reason Gavin got to that really high ranking a couple of years ago is because he studied the system better than yeah. him and knew the tournaments that he had to go to to give himself the best chance of getting to that ranking. Was he playing better table tennis than he was? Was it the best table tennis he'd ever played in his career? I, I don't know. I wasn't there. I would, no, suspect, no, no. I would suspect probably not. But he got the wins at the tournaments that he needed to get to. And that's that's part of being a professional athlete. Yeah, He's yeah. A professional yeah. table tennis player. And too, again, too many players um, don't think about these things. That allowed him to get better contracts, better teams and... In, in Europe, which is what pays his bills. So that's that's good yeah. him to do that. Dave, Dave, just to come in just on Craig's sure. point there, I mean, um, I think, I mean, Craig, obviously listening to you, there's a general, you're a team player. You can see that about even the things about your future ambitions is to help Table Tennis Scotland. I think the things you're talking about, about the team, about being number two, being part of that team. Uh, I think the difference with Gavin to some extent, and maybe it's just something self-reflection and maybe looking at your own career, is it's that I only care about myself. Like, and in all fair, I mean, I'm very close to Gavin. I grew up with him, so I, I know that as a person. I don't mean that as detriment to him, but it's to be that single-mindedness as a as a individual sport, which table tennis is. What yeah. Gavin did in that point you brought up is totally understood. How can I make myself better? All for like getting in the Olympic squad, whatever it is. Um, and I think obviously reflecting that back to Scottish table tennis, I think that's maybe where we struggle a little bit is we've never had people that single-mindedness to go, it's all about me. And I think that's maybe, looking I, back, especially when you mentioned Moscow or finishing one place in England, and I didn't know that myself. And you're like, well, why didn't we go on from there? What stopped us? Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, a, a couple of things. I think on that point, I think um, I, was, I was pretty single-minded in the training hall. If somebody, I was pretty grumpy in the training hall, I was pretty aggressive. Somebody wasn't, you know, pulling their weight in the training hall. I would let them know, and I'd give them a hard time in order to bring the level up of the whole group. But I wasn't ruthless enough, and I wasn't na and, and nasty enough, right? And you need that when it really mattered, right? When it really mattered, when it was really gritty in, in matches and in tournaments, and I. I um, and I still wouldn't be now, but I think in table tennis you need that to absolutely fulfil your potential. And um, Rumgey absolutely has that single-mindedness, probably more so than anyone else in Britain, just about. Amelia, anything else from yourself? I can't think of anything right now. I'm trying to think. Sorry. I can't think of anything right now. No, you're quite happy just listening. Right. Just, 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 just dive in. Um, you know when when anything comes up. Okay, so you, you have, uh, as I say, we we read out your CV, which is virtually every title apart from the vets, um, and you can think about that in the next ten years. Um, you've you've played in a lot of finals. You're starting to get. Injuries. Tell us about the shoulder injury and when it first reared its ugly head or its ugly shoulder. Yeah, so um, basically the two years prior to Gold Coast Commonwealth Games 2018, I started to get this pain in the front of my shoulder joint and it wasn't going away. And I went to see various physios and doctors. They thought it was a tear in the uh, labral tissue which doesn't have a blood supply so that means it doesn't doesn't get any better um, they thought it was various anyway I ended up getting an MRI scan to paint for a private MRI scan because the wait list was so long and, and basically what it found is that your, your shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint 
but it's very different to other ball and socket joints. It's like it's like a golf ball sitting on a on a golf tee, and so as a, you know, most so socket ball and socket joints sit in the joint like that. Whereas my the shoulders got a little bit more space to move because it can rotate, you know, it can rotate um, three hundred and sixty degrees, and and it sits on a on a, like a tee, a golf tee. And so the actual ball can move about quite a lot in the socket. Right, right. And, and basically, um, my shoulder was set because of years of table tennis and years of not doing the necessary, necessary um, injury prevention stuff like stretching, like yoga, like Pilates, etc. My shoulder just edged forward and forward and forward and had been grinding against the bone at the front of my AC joint in my shoulder. And... Now, at that point, at 26, it was becoming impossible to train properly. So between, between 2016 and 2018, I got big physio, basically. I paid for physio for most of that time, um, which isn't cheap. <laughs> um, basically, every week for two years, more or less. And then in the run-up to the Commonwealth Games, um, in the run-up to, to the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games in the sort of eight months in the run-up, I had about three or four cortisone injections into my shoulder, uh, which just masks the pain. Doesn't, doesn't um, you know, uh, relieve the symptoms, doesn't make the symptom, uh, doesn't make the, you know, doesn't operate on the actual problem. It just relieves you of the pain, which then allows you to train and make it, make the, essentially make the problem even worse. And, and by that stage, I was then doing lots of exercises and, and prehab stuff, which was trying to get the shoulder moving back into the joint as much as possible. But um, ultimately, it was years and years. We're talking years and years that have taken yeah. me to that point. And that amount of um, you know, exercises while training wasn't going to be enough to, 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 to make the pain go away. So... I missed, the, I missed the national championship because of it. Um, and tra training was very, very difficult, very sore, very stressful um, as a result of it. And then, and, and, you know, so table tennis became a real burden at that point. And, um, it, okay, what... Would you like to reflect on in your career? What would you say? Uh, obviously, the injuries are low. Uh, uh, there's, there's also there's always lows in sport. So, um, what's your? And we all have our low points. Were your low points towards the end of your career, um, the middle of your career? As I was saying to you the other day, did winning become more important than playing table tennis? Yeah, I mean, so there was a couple of occasions where I felt completely helpless in my table tennis career. I'd had these really big high, up until 2010, I'd trained with Tom and had improved loads until 16. Then I'd gone down south and trained in Bristol and Sheffield, the top players in the country. And then I came back up here and Lee Chow was here, so I was able to train 20 hours a week with top, top level players and coaches. And then after the Commonwealth Games in, in Delhi, I'm 20 years old. My world ranking has like shot up. I'm now, you know, undoubtedly number two in Scotland by, by a way. I am looking to push on against the best in, in Britain and Europe that are my age. And Sports Scotland pull the funding. No funding, no training in Scotland, no national coaching, um, no national coach, no organised training. Now, going from having a, a very good setup and going through to Glasgow and training all the time with me too, and, and to having nothing and having to organise training myself, and even still then, all the players were in Glasgow. So I was still having to travel through to Glasgow between 2010 and 2012, and then not having the same setup. Not through anyone in table tennis Scotland's fault at the time, in terms of none of the players or anything like that, but just of things which were out, of, out with my control. 
Now, there's a thing in sports psychology called learned helplessness. When you do everything you can to get better and you're willing to knock your pan in, basically, to get better and train hard and, and do whatever else, but there's, there's things, there's barriers to, to, to that which stop you from being able to, to achieve your goals and to achieve the progress you want to get, you, you feel helpless. What can I do? What can I do to get better? There's no mechanism for me to get better. I want to get better, but I'm being stopped by the very people who are meant to be responsible for helping me get better. And so, um, you know, it's like a, it's, you know, it's, you you become, you lose your enjoyment. And, that, and that's really when the enjoyment of the game was, was, was taken away from me. And that, that then carried on, even though we got highs of getting funding and things like that, and the Glasgow Commonwealth game. That that two years between sort of end of 2010-2011 to to halfway through Martin Marzi being here in 2013, two and a half years, was a real low point for me, and I, where I made very at a time where I was progressing like this, and then if anything went down. And, and some of the top Irish guys went abroad in that time and, and trained full time. I was doing my most serious two years at university. And yeah, just very, very um, difficult to accept that I'd lost that, that period in your career as a table tennis player is extremely important, as we talked about previously on the on your university show. And I, I felt that two years of it for me had been flushed down the toilet due to things that I had no control over. And so, well, you know, it, it's, it, it, it sucked the life, it sucked the enjoyment out of table tennis for me massively. And unfortunately, that sort of stayed with me throughout the rest of my career. And so, yeah, that, that was definitely the lowest moment. And, and things got, got better and what have you, but that was... Uh, that was a massive changing point in how I perceived table tennis in my life um, yeah. for the rest of my career. But but you, but you still carried on playing for a number of years. So as you were saying, did it? Did, did you accept that to be the norm then, um, or was it just never the same again? Um, it definitely was never the same again. Yeah, it was definitely never the same again. I was able to get back to some level, but my confidence, again, looking back now, you've got to control the controllables, right? And so there's more that I could have done in that time to, to seek out better or train more purposefully or train better. Um, but as a, as a 21 year old trying to do university and, and play table tennis at the same time, I didn't, I didn't have that knowledge. I didn't have that perspective to be able to stand back and look at things in the big, big picture the way I am now. Um, I kept playing because a couple of things. Because I, I, um, I was still number two in Scotland. I was still able to travel the world and play these tournaments all over the place. I still, as you said, Dave, I still loved winning. I still loved competing. Didn't have any injuries at the time. And we had um, the Glasgow Commonwealth Games come up in two, three years' time. And I knew that there would be an upturn in funding and we would, and I was very heavily involved in, in trying to get things um, better for the, for the players and for the team. Um, so, so there was hope on the horizon yeah. that things could get better. When I finished playing at 28, I didn't have that hope for, for a variety of reasons, not because of other players or coaching or whatever. I didn't have the hope of things getting better for me for a variety of reasons that we've been talking about. Interesting. Mark? Um, just, uh, I'm obviously conscious of time, just uh, one I wanted to bring everyone's attention to a game that I feel is underrated. And I remember watching it live because it was one of the rare events. The Six Nations was actually streamed live. 
Um, so it was 2015, and Craig got to the final against Gavin in the Six Nations. And it was one of the bit. And I, I, I'm not. I'm going to apologise to Gavin and uh, his parents because always I've probably been in hit their corner uh, or Gavin's corner. But actually watching this game, I was probably rooting for Craig. Um, I mean, I mean, in the end, Craig, just to spoil the 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 thing, was you lost 12-10 in the fifth. Six Nations, and obviously we've had the success for Colin last year, picking up the British Championships. Gavin's won it. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that game and that loss, and it also covers one of the questions we had on YouTube tonight uh, from Graham, Graham Stevenson about do we remember the games we win or indeed, or do the defeats leave more of a scar on the mind? Um, yeah. So start on that game, Craig, you have any memories, and what about the defeats? Do they scar you? Oh, um... I had two really, really sore ones that year. So, um, first of all, I can't remember most of the big matches I won, right? Can't remember a thing from the matches. Can't remember a thing from playing Sean apart from that backhand in the final of the Nationals. Can't remember a thing from arguably my biggest win when I beat Paul Drinkle when he was number two in the world junior. Don't remember a thing from playing him. Don't remember when... Me and Sean won the doubles match against Canada on the first night in the Commonwealth Games, live on the BBC, even though I'd love to. Don't remember a thing. To tell you the main, the major points that I lost against Shrumgay in that year, in the two matches that I lost them, in the final of the British Championship and in the final of the Scottish Championship. Final of the British Championship, I was 10-9 up, match ball, 10-9 up after being 2-0 down. And Rumge, you know, we know how good his serve and receive is normally, but he, he popped a serve up high mid-table to my forehand, talking about a forehand flick earlier. And, and probably all I had to do was steer it on the table, get him back from the table. And I hardly won a point, hardly lost a point against him that match when he was back from the table. Um, and I went for the winner. I went for a flick. Flick smash winner, which probably wasn't the wrong necessarily the wrong shot because I put a few on, but it clipped the top of the net or and just went off the table if my memory serves me right, or just just flew off the table. And um, that shot played through my mind for a long, long time. And then in the next Scottish Championship, I played them in the final, and I was 10 9, it was three all 10 9, so match ball. Again, Rumge let me in first, pushed onto my backhand or sort of high mid table, a shot that normally I would put away. And again, went for the winner when I probably didn't need to, I probably could have just spun on and it clipped the top of the net and went off. And they ended up beating me. So 13 11 in the seven. So those two, those two were really, really sore defeats um, for me. British Championship against Rumge, match ball. Scottish Championship against somebody match ball. You know, I, I had 10 finals, nine finals, I think, I had against somebody. Didn't manage to win one. That was the one. Didn't take it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those, it, was, it is a good match. It is a good match. And I have watched it back once, but it, it's, it's hard to watch it. Um, and I always took the losses. One, one big negative for me was I took the losses really badly. So when, if I lost a match at the World Championships in the team event, I found it really hard to get over. You know, I would let it affect me for the next match and the next match, and it, those, those losses would compound each other. And, and Whereas if I won the first match, I was full of confidence and I was too emotional like that. Um, so, so, yeah, definitely losses are much, much sore than the wins are. The, the losses are much lower than the wins are high. I, I think most top players remember their losses and, and not the wins, yeah. Well, that, that it's been a fascinating hour. Um, the only disappointing, we've, we've listed all of um, Craig's um, achievements and the most important thing he ever won, he's not even mentioned it, he was the very first winner of the David Fairhome Cup. I bet you didn't know that. The very first winner. Wait, what was that? Yeah, yeah, you was the first <laughs> winner. When we, when we went to present you with a cup, you'd gone home. But you'll all, so that can go down as the highlight of your career, Craig. Well, but Dave, what, so what was it? What is the David Fairholme Cup? 
it was it's it was the when you won the Edinburgh for the last time. Right. Uh, each tournament I go to, um, it, it it's for whatever. And I've watched the day, and I and I and I said to um, Gordon Muir, I think I'd like Craig to be the very first winner. And so, so we got it all ready, and we called out your name, and you'd gone home. There we are. There we are. Yeah. Apologies. But anyway, if you, if you make a comeback, you might get a chance of winning it again. Anyway, a big thank you, Craig. Um, a lot of us to a lot to think about there. Uh, your highs, your lows. Um, I hope the messages got across to the youngsters about your flexibility work. Um, try to put your wins and your losses into perspective. Perspective is a key word. And um, and again, thanks to Mark and thanks to Amelia. And once and obviously to Matt 